Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, Lucia Milanig and Pete Musto report on a popular seafood in the United States. Then we will bring you a new program called What It Takes, a collection of interviews with people who have, in some way, changed the world. Later, we will bring you a story by American author O. Henry in American Stories. But first, here is Lucia Milanig. What have ten legs, two of them large claws, a hard shell cover, and live in oceans, fresh water, and on land? Crabs, of course. There are thousands of different kinds of crabs all over the world. They can be as small as a few millimeters across or grow as big as four meters. And all play an important part in the environments in which they live. Crabs may look strange, but many people also find them delicious. The blue crab is an especially popular crab for eating in the United States. These crabs can grow up to about 23 centimeters, and they get their name from the blue coloring on the legs and claws. Blue crabs live in the waters of the Western Atlantic Ocean and in the Gulf of Mexico. However, one place in America is especially famous for its blue crabs, the Chesapeake Bay. This largest U.S. estuary borders Maryland and Virginia. Both states have long made use of the Chesapeake for food, transportation, and fun. All around the area, you can see images of the blue crab on clothing, advertisements, cars, and in restaurant windows. Scientists in Maryland and Virginia say the bay holds hundreds of millions of blue crabs. From early spring through much of fall, thousands of people hit the water to capture some of these creatures. Pete White works with Captain White's Seafood City in Washington, D.C. The family-owned business gathers crabs and other seafood from the bay and sells it at its store right along the Potomac River. White told VOA that his family has been in the business for about 100 years. He is a big fan of Chesapeake blue crabs. These are the best crabs, in my opinion, out of all the country, White said. I get a lot of people coming from Pennsylvania, a lot of people out of Jersey, New York, North Carolina. They come from Georgia, and they take them home on their car ride. White said blue crabs are special because of their sweet meat. There are many ways to cook blue crabs. Some people like to grill them, while others make crab soup. But the cooking style most traditional to the area is steaming. The first step, White explained, is to combine water or beer with vinegar in a large metal container. Then, White adds Old Bay. Old Bay is a seasoning product of hot and salty spices. It was created in Baltimore, Maryland in 1939. Then you turn on the heat and wait for the liquid to boil. The crabs are always cooked alive. But White suggested 
they should not touch the water directly. They normally are placed flat on a rack just above the water. Old Bay can be added to each layer of crabs. It takes 20 to 30 minutes for the steam from the boiling liquid to cook the crabs. Then they are removed from the container. And White said they can be mixed with more Old Bay. Cooking crabs is fairly easy, but eating them can be a challenge. The shells are still very hard. Some people use special tools called crackers and mallets to crack the shells and reach the meat. Others use their hands, breaking at weak points of the shell. Either way, it is a messy meal that usually leaves the eaters covered in shell, bits of meat, and lots of red seasoning. Each blue crab only has between about 60 and 100 grams of meat in them. So sellers most often sell them by the bushel, meaning in groups of about 60 to 100. People usually buy them when they are feeding a lot of people. The so-called crab feast has become a summer tradition in the Chesapeake region. Kate Livy knows a lot about crab feasts. She is the director of education at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in St. Michael's, Maryland. Livy says that close access to the bay and its resources have always been important to people. Native Americans such as the Powhatan, the Piscataway, and the Nanticoke lived in the area long before Europeans arrived in the 1500s. Scientists have found evidence that these Native Americans enjoyed crabs as well as other seafood, such as oysters. In fact, oysters were the main seafood of choice from the Chesapeake for many early years, Livy says. But improvements in food preservation especially in keeping it cold, changed everything for the crab market in the warm summer months. Although blue crabs were eaten through the 17th and 18th century, you couldn't sell more than you could eat in a day, she told VOA via Skype. So food preservation technology and transportation turned crabs from kind of free but priceless into an incredibly successful and economically important harvest. There was also improvement in the crabbing industry. A local fisherman invented a trap for crabs in the 1920s. The trap, called a crab pot, made it easier to catch the animals. Plus, Livy says, Old Bay and some advertising campaigns helped grow the crab market. And she says the blue crab became a major part of the Maryland identity. However, the blue crab has weathered some stormy seas. Bruce Vogt is a manager of the Chesapeake Bay Office of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. He says that pollution and other problems have had a serious effect on the health of the bay and its crabs. In fact, in 2008, scientists reported that the blue crab came very close to disappearing from the Chesapeake completely. But efforts that began in the 1970s to improve the Chesapeake's conditions continue, Vogt says. And this year, researchers estimated there were 254 million female blue crabs in the bay, the largest population since 1990. Vogt argues that people who love crabs cannot simply hope they will always be there. He says people must work to guarantee their survival. That is why experts push for conservation action 
including limiting the harvest of females to about 25%. There's obviously a lot of work to do, Vote told VOA via Skype. We can't just sit back and expect that everything is going well now and we'll have crabs in the future. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Lucia Malanik. Next, Alice Winkler will present the program, What It Takes. Today, you will hear part of an interview with a person whom many consider to be one of the greatest baseball players of all time, Willie Mays. Here now is What It Takes. It all was so clear. It it was just like the picture started to form itself. My advice is, if they're going to break your leg once when you go in that place, stay out of there. (laughs) This is What It Takes, a podcast about passion, vision, and perseverance from the Academy of Achievement's recorded collection. I'm Alice Winkler. On every episode of What It Takes, you'll hear a revealing conversation with someone who has changed the world. Rosa Parks, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Linus Pauling, to name just a few. Their personal stories may be vastly different, but all of them are inspiring. And it's the Academy of Achievement's mission, after all, to show you don't have to be a superhero to make a difference. Now, some might argue that Willie Mays, the subject of today's episode, actually comes as close to being a superhero as any human. But in this 1996 interview, Mays said no. Go ahead and look up to him if you like, but a hero he is not. When you're talking about heroes, I think the heroes should come from your mother and your fathers because they are the ones got to teach you for right and for wrong. Now, you can admire whoever you want to admire, but that particular person is not going to teach you. You're going to go out and try to emulate whatever he does, but your mother and father is going to be there with you every day from day in and day out. They are your heroes. I feel my father was my hero. Willie Mays' father was a Pullman porter on the trains and a steel worker who also played baseball on the Steel Mills Negro team. He made a good living, and so Willie never had to worry about going hungry, like a lot of the people he knew growing up in the 1930s. Willie Mays' mother was a great athlete, too, a track star. So Mays admits he was born with an overdose of athletic prowess. Talented as he was at sports, though, it didn't occur to him that he would play in the major leagues, let alone become one of, if not the greatest all-round baseball players of all time. He was born into the segregated South, after all, just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. So there were limits. But Willie Mays insists the circumstances didn't fill him with anger. Well, I I, I was, like I say, I was very fortunate to play sports. All the anger in me went out. Uh, I had to do what I had to do, you know, and you, you, if you stay anger all the time, then you really don't have a good life. You know, we, we knew what was going on, you know, but uh, again, you, if you just stay focused on what is happening as far as your life is concerned, uh, I don't think you, you, you have a hard time. Sure, we went, to, like Vince and I went to an all-black school. I didn't, you know, it wasn't mixed or anything. And when you say had to be some anger there, sure. But what, what good it was going to do? Who, who are you going to go to uh, to tell about what is happening as far as your community is concerned? So you... The, my father was uh, a type of guy that would go out and pull the punches, punches for, from me. Uh, when, like I said, when I had a job that uh, I didn't like and it wasn't good for me, he would say, hey, don't work, you, you're going to play baseball. And I really didn't understand what he was talking about at that, that time, but he was saying, you're not going into a cotton field. But that's number one. That means picking cotton down there and putting it in the side, carrying it on your shoulder. You're not going to do that. You're going to play baseball. You're going to be the best. He he, he just drilled it. I had the best shoes. I had the best gloves, best everything as far as sports was concerned. So uh, my house was like a sporting goods shop. 
Uh, when p kids didn't have shoes, they'd come and get my shoes, wear them, bring them back. We had a good relationship in my community when I played, you know. Willie Mays' father may have done whatever he could to pave the way for his son to make it in sports, but he also insisted that Willie finish high school. When the Birmingham Black Barons made an offer to sign the 15-year-old, his dad struck a deal with the team's manager. Willie would continue to go to school five days a week and play for the team on weekends and in the summer. His high school coaches actually weren't too happy about the arrangement. Once he went pro, Willie wasn't allowed to play for his school teams anymore, and he had been the star of all three, football, basketball, and baseball. Basketball was my uh, second sports. Uh, football was my first. Baseball was my last. But I picked baseball because it was the easiest of uh, the three, and I don't think I had a problem with that. But uh, the others, I thought I would get hurt in, so I just picked that. And my father didn't have money for me to go to college, and at that particular time, they didn't have black quarterbacks, and uh, I don't think I could have made it in basketball because I was only 5'11", so I just picked baseball. There was no height limit there in baseball. You just go in and play and have a good time. It may not have been his number one choice, but lucky for baseball, Willie Mays realized he loved the game. I love defense more than offense. And defense, and to me, is the key to playing baseball. I know people say, well, you got to score runs, but you got to stop them before you can score runs. And I, I used to love to run out of fly ball. I used to love to throw a guy out. But, of course, I played good offense, too. But I, I just felt baseball was a, a beautiful game, especially at night. The sun, I mean, you have the lights out there, and all you do is go out there, and you're out there by yourself in center field, and it's uh, just a beautiful game. And I just felt that it was such a beautiful game that I just wanted to play it forever, you know. Uh, when where I used to go to, you know, when I was in Birmingham, I used to go to a place called Rickwood Field. And I used to get there on 2 o'clock game. I'm there at 12 o'clock. Because why can you make this kind of money playing sports? It, it was just a pleasure just to have me go out and enjoy myself and get paid for it. I didn't understand why people didn't want to play, you know, so... It kept stayed with me all the time when I until I got to professional ball, and then when I got to professional ball, uh, I would try and help everybody because the game was so easy for me. You know, it was just like, hey, walking in the park again. So, how did Willie Mays get to be as good as he was before he'd even gotten to high school? I don't know. It wasn't hard. It wasn't anything that I had to look for. When you say, "How do I get to be as good?" Well. I was there. If, if you're talking about throwing a football, I could throw a football further. Are you throwing a baseball further than anybody in my community or anybody around that area? Uh, basketball, I would score 20 points stop. That was enough. We used to have guys used to uh, bet on things that, like, hey, he's going to score 20 points tonight. You know, So I would never bet, but the guys around me, because I could hear him, you got to get 20 tonight. So I would... I was probably one of the best basketball players in my area now. And uh, when you say, how did I get that, I, I really don't know. I just, I just was created. I just did what I had to do. Some guys that are uh, so-called superstars can't tell you how they do things. It's creative. You just do it. And whatever comes out, it comes out, it comes out good. I never had any training. I never had uh, a guy say to me, do it this way, do it that way. Every team that I was on, I was the last guy to get picked. I'm talking about as I'm growing up now. I was the last guy to get picked. The reason for that is that whatever a guy couldn't play, that's what I did. If, a guy came, they, if everybody came out, there was a pitcher needed, I pitch. If there was a catcher me, I catch. And then I caught. But if that was a first baseman, shortstop, whatever position they needed, that's what I played. And uh, I, I felt I was the best athlete around that, that particular team that I could do that. Most of them couldn't do that. Everybody wanted to play a position. It didn't matter what I played. you know. So uh, I just had fun and enjoyed it. And what about all the hard work? The countless hours of practice under one of the toughest, most demanding managers in baseball, Leo DeRocher? Well, turns out... 
Let me tell you something. I, I, I came out of the Army in 1954. I had played in the Army. I hadn't played for, uh, I would say, about five months, because in, in Newport News, Virginia, where I was uh, located, uh, we, play, we didn't play from September until uh, around April or something like that. I get out of the Army, and three months early, I get out in February, end of February, I show up at spring training. I get there at 5, I mean, 12 o'clock. The game started at 1.05. Leo said, go put on a uniform. I go put on a uniform. I haven't, I'm getting off the plane now. I haven't thrown a ball, haven't seen a ball in five months. I put on a plane, he said, want to play? I said, okay, I go out. First ball hit was over my head against the fence. Was this in Phoenix then? It's called, it was on uh, Central Avenue, okay? Next ball hit through the middle. I threw out a runner going to third. Uh, next ball, then Leo said, gee, you want to hit? First time up, home run. No, I never worked at anything pertaining to sports. I think I should have, but I think, now, uh, it's two things, two parts here. I think that all athletes should practice. They should practice because you want to know what's happening as far as when the game is concerned. I didn't have to do that. In spring training, when people go out running, you know, like they run laps around things, like that, I would go in and sleep. I would sleep until they get through. Then I would go out, and then I would go out and run around the bases for a minute, and then I would hit. That's my spring training. I never had any problem as far as my body was concerned. I was very blessed with a good body, never got hurt, never was in the hospital. The only time I was in the hospital was when I would get exhausted a little bit and go in for a checkup or something. But uh, I was blessed with a body that I didn't have to do all that. You know, like uh, if I went 0 for 5 or 0 for 6, I didn't get hit for two, two days. I wouldn't take no batting practice for like two or three days because I felt I was tired. So I would go in and just rest and go play the game. Show up, if the game is one o'clock, I show up at 12, go play the game, go back home, come the next day, play the, play the game. To listen to more of this interview with Willie Mays, find the program, What It Takes, on our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Next, we bring you a story by American author O. Henry in this week's edition of American Stories. After 20 years, the cop moved along the street looking strong and important. This was the way he always moved. He was not thinking of how he looked. There were few people on the street to see him. It was only about ten at night, but it was cold, and there was a wind with a little rain in it. He stopped at doors as he walked along, trying each door to be sure that it was closed for the night. Now and then he turned and looked up and down the street. He was a fine-looking cop, watchful, guarding the peace. People in this part of the city went home early. Now and then you might see the lights of a shop or a small restaurant. But most of the doors belonged to business places that had been closed hours ago. Then the cop suddenly slowed his walk. Near the door of a darkened shop, a man was standing. As the cop walked toward him, the man spoke quickly. It's all right, officer, he said. I'm waiting for a friend. Twenty years ago, we agreed to meet here tonight. It sounds strange to you, doesn't it? I'll explain if you want to be sure that everything's all right. About twenty years ago, there was a restaurant here where this shop stands. Big Joe Brady's Restaurant. It was here until five years ago, said the cop. The man near the door had a colorless square face with bright eyes and a little white mark near his right eye. He had a large jewel in his necktie. Twenty years ago tonight, said the man, I had dinner here with Jimmy Wells. He was my best friend and the best fellow in the world. He and I grew up together here in New York like two brothers. I was eighteen and Jimmy was twenty. 
The next morning, I was to start for the West. I was going to find a job and make a great success. You couldn't have pulled Jimmy out of New York. He thought it was the only place on earth. <laughs> we agreed that night that we would meet here again in 20 years. We thought that in 20 years we would know what kind of men we were and what future waited for us. It sounds interesting, said the cop. A long time between meetings, it seems to me. Have you heard from your friends since you went west? Yes, for a time we did write to each other, said the man. But after a year or two we stopped. The west is big. I moved around everywhere, and I moved quickly. But I know that Jimmy will meet me here if he can. He was as true as any man in the world. He'll never forget. I came a thousand miles to stand here tonight. But I'll be glad about that if my old friend comes too. The man waiting took out a fine watch covered with small jewels. Three minutes before ten, he said. It was ten that night when we said goodbye here at the restaurant door. You were successful in the West, weren't you? asked the cop. I surely was. I hope Jimmy has done half as well. He was a slow mover. I've had to fight for my success. In New York, a man doesn't change much. In the West, you learn how to fight for what you get. The cop took a step or two. I'll go on my way, he said. I hope your friend comes all right. If he isn't here at ten, are you going to leave? I am not, said the other. I'll wait half an hour at least. If Jimmy is alive on this earth, he'll be here by that time. Good night, officer. Good night, said the cop and walked away, trying doors as he went. There was now a cold rain falling and the wind was stronger. The few people walking along that street were hurrying, trying to keep warm. At the door of the shop stood the man who had come a thousand miles to meet a friend. Such a meeting could not be certain, but he waited. About twenty minutes he waited. And then a tall man in a long coat came hurrying across the street. He went directly to the waiting man. Is that you, Bob? he asked doubtfully. Is that you, Jimmy Wells? cried the man at the door. The new man took the other man's hand in his. It's Bob! It surely is! I was certain I would find you here if you were still alive. Twenty years is a long time. The old restaurant is gone, Bob. I wish it were here. So that we could have another dinner in it. Has the West been good to you? They gave me everything I asked for. You've changed, Jimmy. I never thought you were so tall. Ah, oh, I grew a little after I was 20. Are you doing well in New York, Jimmy? Well enough. I work for the city. Come on, Bob. We'll go to a place I know and have a good long talk about old times. The two men started along the street arm in arm. The man from the West was beginning to tell the story of his life. The other, with his coat up to his ears, listened with interest. At the corner stood a shop bright with electric lights. When they came near, each turned to look at the other's face. The man from the West stopped suddenly and pulled his arm away. You're not Jimmy Wells, he said. Twenty years is a long time, but not long enough to change the shape of a man's nose. It sometimes changes a good man into a bad one, said the tall man. You've been under arrest for ten minutes, Bob. Chicago cops thought you might be coming to New York. They told us to watch for you. Are you coming with me quietly? That's wise. But first, here's something I was asked to give you. You may read it here at the window. It's from a cop named Wells. The man from the West opened the little piece of paper. His hand began to shake a little as he read. Bob, I was at the place on time. I saw the face of the man wanted by Chicago cops. I didn't want to arrest you myself. So I went and got another cop and sent him to do the job. Jimmy. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 